How do we classify things? We consider people to be experts in a field if they've mastered classification. Doctors can classify between a good blood sample and a bad one. Photographers can classify if their latest shot was beautiful or not. Musicians can classify what sounds good and what doesn't in a piece of music. The ability to classify well takes many hours of training. We get it wrong over and over again until eventually we get it right. But with a quality data set, deep learning can classify just as well, if not better, than we can. We'll use it as a tool to improve our craft, whatever it is. And if a job is monotonous, it'll do it for us. When we reach the point where we aren't forced to do something we don't want to just to survive, we'll flourish like never before. And that's the world we're aiming for. Hello world, it's Siraj, and today we're gonna build an image classifier from scratch to classify cats and dogs. Finally, we get to work with images. I'm feeling hype enough to do the Macarena. Here we so how does image classification work? Well, there were a bunch of different attempts in the 80s and early 90s, and all of them tried a similar approach. Think about the features that make up an image and hand code detectors for each of them. But there is so much variety out there. No two apples look exactly the same, so the results were always terrible. This was considered a task only we humans could do. But in 98, a researcher named Jan LeCun introduced a model called a convolutional neural network capable of classifying characters with a 9 99% accuracy, which broke every record. Lacoon CNN learned features by itself. In 2012, it was used by another researcher named Alex Kraszewski at the yearly ImageNet competition, which is basically the annual Olympics of computer vision, and it was able to classify thousands of images with a new record accuracy at the time of 85%. Since then, CNNs have been adopted by Google to identify photos in search, Facebook for automatic tagging. Basically, they are very hot right now. But where did the idea for CNNs come from. Hey yo, these comnets all be inspired by a cortex. Every single thing we see enters the vortex. Some cells fire for lines and stuff for signs. Neurons in a column organize a line and this helps us classify what we see. Cats, dogs, pigs, men, even broccoli. Comnets learn dope bass filters for features. Classifying me as the king of teachers. We'll first want to download our image data set from Kaggle with 1,024 pictures of dogs and cats, each in its own folder. We'll be using the Keras Deep Learning Library for this demo, which is a high-level wrapper that runs on top of TensorFlow. It makes building models really intuitive since we can define each layer as its own line of code. First things first, we'll initialize variables for our training and validation data. Then we're ready to build our model. We'll initialize the type of model using the sequential function, which will allow us to build a linear stack of layers so we treat each layer as an object that feeds data to the next one. It's like a conga line. Kind of. No. The alternative would be a graph model, which would allow for multiple separate inputs and outputs, but we're using a more simple example. Next, we'll add our first layer, the convolutional layer. The first layer of a CNN is always the convolutional layer. The input is going to be a 32 by 32 by 3 array of pixel values. The 3 refers to RGB values. Each of the numbers in this array is given a value from 0 to 255, which describes the pixel intensity at that point. The idea is that given this as an input, our CNN will describe the probability of it being of a certain class. We can imagine the convolutional layer as a flashlight shining over the top left of the image. The flashlight slides across all the areas of the input image. The flashlight is our filter, and the region it shines over is the receptive field. Our filter is also an array of numbers. These numbers are weights at a particular layer. We can think of a filter as a feature identifier. As our filter slides or convolves around the input, it is multiplying its values with the pixel values in the image. These are called element-wise multiplications. The multiplications from each region are then summed up, and after we've covered all parts of the image, we're left with the feature map. This will help us find not buried treasure, but a prediction, which is even better. Since our weights are randomly initialized, our filter won't start off being able to detect any specific feature, but during training, our CNN will learn values for its filters. So this first one will learn to detect a low-level feature like curves. So if we place this filter on a part of the image with a curve, the resulting value from the multiplication and summation is a big number. But if we place it on a different part of the image without a curve, the resulting value is zero. This is how filters detect features. We'll next pass this feature map through an activation layer called ReLU, or Rectified Linear Unit. ReLU is probably the name of some alien, but it's also a nonlinear operation that replaces all the negative pixel values in the feature map with zero. 
We could use other functions, but ReLU tends to perform better in most situations. This layer increases the nonlinear properties of our model, which means our neural net will be able to learn more complex functions than just linear regression. After that, we'll initialize our max pooling layer. Pooling reduces the dimensionality of each feature map, but retains the most important information. This reduces the computational complexity of our network. There are different types, but in our case, we'll use max, which takes the largest element from the rectified feature map within a window we define, and we'll slide this window over each region of our feature map, taking the max values. So a classic CNN architecture looks like this. Three convolutional blocks followed by a fully connected layer. We've initialized the first three layers. We can basically just repeat this process twice more. The output feature map is fed into the next convolutional layer, and the filter in this layer will learn to detect more abstract features like pause and doge. One technique we'll use to prevent overfitting that point when our model isn't able to predict labels for novel data is called dropout. A dropout layer drops out a random set of activations in that layer by setting them to zero as data flows through it. To prepare our data for the dropout, we'll first flatten the feature map into one dimension. Then we'll want to initialize a fully connected layer with the dense function and apply ReLU to it. After dropout, we'll initialize one more fully connected layer. This will output an n-dimensional vector, where n is the number of classes we have, so it would be 2. And by applying a sigmoid to it, it will convert the data to probabilities for each class. So how does our network learn? Well, we'll want to minimize a loss function which measures the difference between the target output and the expected output. To do this, we'll take the derivative of the loss with respect to the weights in each layer starting from the last to compute the direction we want our network to update. We'll propagate our loss backwards for each layer, then we'll update our weight values for each filter so they can change in the direction of the gradient that will minimize our loss. We can configure the learning process by using the compile method, where we'll define our loss as binary cross entropy, which is the preferred loss function for binary classification problems. Then our optimizer, RMS prop, which will perform gradient descent and a list of metrics which we'll set to accuracy since this is a classification problem. Lastly, we'll write out our fit function to train the model, giving it parameters for the training and validation data, as well as a number of epochs to run for each. And let's save our weights so we can use our trained model later. Overall accuracy comes to be about 70%, similar to my attention span. And if we feed our model a new picture of a dog or cat, it will predict its label relatively accurately. We could definitely improve our prediction though by either using more pictures or by augmenting an existing pre-trained network with our own network, which is considered transfer learning. So to break it down, convolutional neural networks are inspired by the human visual cortex and offer state-of-the-art in image classification. CNNs learn filters at each convolutional layer that act as increasingly abstract feature detectors. And with Keras and TensorFlow, you can build your own pretty easily. The winner of the coding challenge from the last video is Charles David Blot. He used TensorFlow to build a deep net capable of predicting whether or not someone would get a match or not after training on a data set and had a pretty sweet data visualization of his results. Wizard of the Week. And the runner-up is L.A. Mingat. Clean, organized, and documented code. The coding challenge for this video is to create an image classifier for two types of animals. Instructions are in the README. Post your GitHub link in the comments, and I'll announce the winner next Friday. Please subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. Check out this related video. And for now, I gotta upload my mind. So, thanks for watching.